Ahoy, and welcome to the Jolly Reader. I'm your host, Captain Book. Today, we finally finished the Truly Devious series. We're finishing up with The Hand on the Wall, Part 2 by Maureen Johnson. We're going to cover chapters 14 through 28, pages 180 through 368. Okay, so (laughs) before we finish this, I got some beef. I don't know. If you've made it this far, you know I haven't really liked this series, but okay, I'm just going to lay it out before we get started. So one, this author clearly has some major strong personal political opinions, which is fine, but it doesn't have any place in this book. And like, spoiler alert, the Edward King stuff is pointless and it's just so, it's just for filler and like, so the author can insert her own like problems with politics or something. It's just boring and pointless and I don't like it and just like a side note she talks about how evil and discriminative he is but she can't keep Vi's requested pronoun as they straight throughout the book but whatever also number two Stevie and David are very very toxic like the most trauma bonding to the max and This is not just like in this book, but I really don't like this kind of stuff being normalized in books, especially in teen novels to be like, oh, a normal relationship is when someone ignores you and is mean to you and but you yearn for them and then you get back together. It's so tumultuous and ridiculous. But I could have looked over all of this, maybe, if the book was actually consistent and made sense. The three books, there is not one real aha moment, which is super disappointing, and We'll get into it, but the ending had to be changed. Like something had to be changed that's clearly stated in this book and the other books to give the main bad guy motive, which is just not okay with me. That's not a murder mystery. This It literally could be anyone. So that being said, let's get into this so we can finish what we started and never talk about it again. Summary, 1930s slash 40s, I guess. We found out that Alice was adopted by the Ellinghams and her real parents are Flora Robinson and George Marsh. George is told he's the father and is now trying to find out what happened to her, and we find out that the red tin belonged to Dottie. 2017. Stevie finds out that Ellie knew who projected the truly devious type letter on her wall, but we don't know who it is. Janelle's project blows up, the school's being closed because of the accidents and the weather, and David shows up needing everyone's help. Things to look forward to. A very heavy on the quotes moose multiple grave sites, and I guess this series being over because nothing happens. Let's get into it. Chapter 14. I promise to make this fun for all of you. Stevie is sulking about David rejecting her. Get used to that. She goes downstairs to where Hunter is going over information David gave them. They're in Minerva House. He hasn't found anything yet. He asks if Stevie and David are a thing. She says no. Then Stevie tells Hunter that Fenton told her that the kid was there. We figure all that out too later on. Hunter said he didn't think anyone was in the house, but he was upstairs with his headphones on. And I said at this point that I thought Fenton was talking about someone in the background of a picture. Like maybe she saw Eddie and was like, the kid is there. The kid was at the house during this thing. That's not what it is, but that would be pretty cool. (laughs) Hunter said that Fenton was convinced that there was a hidden will that the school knew about. The school would collect on it when it expired. We already know the will. Like when Alice turns 17 or I think maybe it's 19 or whatever, then the school gets to use it how they want. Stevie tells Hunter that Charles told her that this wasn't true. There wasn't a will or something. Stevie and Hunter stay up all night playing a card game. They're supposed to be together. They don't end up together because she's got to go for some toxic stuff. But anyways, David comes downstairs ignoring Stevie, trauma bonding, and talking to Hunter. Hunter asks David to use his fake admin person, Jim. That's how he, like, turned off the cameras. To send an email to the school asking about the will. This is an exchange for Hunter helping him with the flash drives, but Hunter's really doing this because he wants to help Stevie out. David says the internet's down, so he won't know when it'll go through, but he'll send it. So I'll read you the email. I'm writing on behalf of Senator King. The senator would like to see a copy of any legal documents that state that there is some kind of financial benefit for anyone who produces Alice Ellingham. This document has been long rumored to exist. The senator would like to know about any potential legalities or news stories that might involve the school and obviously any kind of turn page windfall that would be rich fodder for the press. Thank you for your attention to this matter big who cares so stevie goes to bed and 
There's some small quips and drama between her and David, but it's not worth mentioning. <laughs> That's what my notes say. Chapter 15. Uh-oh. Ding! There's a asterisk. It's literally to the point where I'm not even reading entire pages because Stevie is telling irrelevant stories I can't even. Like a 1970 cold case in England that was solved because of the paint on the wall. The paint on the wall doesn't become relevant. The biggest of who cares? So Stevie wakes up in the afternoon and Janelle comes in and she admits that her and Vi are arguing. That like kind of doesn't matter. They're mad because Vi wants to help with the flash drive thing and Janelle doesn't want them to so they're in a fight but they make up later big who cares so Janelle goes to the maintenance shed and gets a wall scanner so her and Stevie can look in the walls and they find a diary in Stevie's closet wall and it has like the Bonnie and Clyde pictures and the pictures of Leo so obviously it's Frankie's before Stevie can read it picks knocking on the door and tells him it's time for dinner February 25th 1937 oh this part gets kind of interesting Okay, real talk, I'd rather the book just be like the 1930s. Like, I don't feel like I need this Stevie part. I could have just read one book on the 1930s stuff. So anyways, George is driving Jerry to the cabin that Alice was supposedly kept at, and he tells George what happened to Iris. Okay, so everything was going well, and Andy said he wanted to get a million dollar ransom. That's the other guy that we never meet. Jerry... By the way, they said a third person came in and like took over. That never happened. It's just the two of them this whole time. So that was either poorly written, which is my guess, or it was a lie. But why lie about it? So anyways, Jerry would let Alice just free play when Andy was gone. And one day Iris told Alice to go play and Alice took off running. She like trained her to do that. And Iris got her hands untied and jumped Jerry and Jerry hit her in the head when she reached for his gun. And she was bleeding but still standing. So she ran and then he caught up to her and she like fell down and he hit her a couple more times. And then while all this is happening, Andy came back and just like straight out executed Iris. Then it took them an hour to find her, but they took Alice to that family and said that it was Jerry's niece. It was a bad situation, whatever. Andy took off one day saying he was headed to Cuba and Jerry went back to New York hoping that George would find him because he's like over the whole situation. He didn't even want to like kidnap them supposedly and stuff. So they arrive at the house and a man opens the door and a man says they should have come sooner and he was told that he would keep the girl a week or two and it's been much longer and from my calculations it's been like nine months and the man's like I was only paid for a couple weeks so George gives him like a handful of money and the man says he knows she's the girl from the papers and that she's worth a lot of money and george is like i'll pay you more like let me just have her so the man's like oh she's out back and george is like she's probably out there playing blah 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 it's the middle of winter can we all figure out what's going on so george runs back there and doesn't see her and instead he finds a handmade tombstone so oh our big reveal alice died of the measles two weeks prior to george showing up Okay, so the man's like back in the house and George and Jerry are there. So George has Jerry dig up her grave to make sure it's like her or whatever. They find her. George beats Jerry to death with a shovel and then buries Jerry in Alice's grave. And he takes Alice's body to his car and checks to see if his gun's loaded and heads back to the house. Here's the thing. At one point, like the man is like, my wife loved having a kid around, whatever. So I said, this is BS because... That family didn't kill her. The measles did. And George is just garbage at this point because he just murders a bunch of people that he involved. Like he hired Jerry for this and Jerry didn't kill anybody. So George is just going to kill him. And then these people were just like taking care of her and they didn't kill her or anything. But he just goes in and murders them or it's assumed he does. And none of this would happen if he didn't plan on kidnapping him in the first place. So he's just a trash human being murderer at this point. Chapter 16. Okay, so this is like Frankie's diary. She writes a lot of stuff, but like I'm only picking out the important stuff. So let's read. September 20th, 1935. A bright spark. His name is Eddie. He's a very interesting boy. If he's the same Eddie I'm thinking of, the stories about him are something else. They say he fathered a baby once and the girl had to be sent away somewhere outside of Boston to give birth in private. He looks capable of it. I intend to find out more. And then September 21st, I asked Eddie about the baby. He smiled and asked me if I'd like to find out about it. 
that he be willing to show me. I told him if he said anything like that (laughs) to me again, I put out a cigarette in his eye. We're going to meet tonight after dark. So I said, I called it kind of, but Leo says that Alice looks like Marsh and that's how he figured it out. So WTF. None of that comes back ever. Like they never say that he fathered a baby, but like why even put that in there? If it's like misdirection, it's terrible. I don't know. Anyway, so then there's a poem. I don't know why I shut my book. Okay, so it's called Our Treasure. All that I care about starts at nine. Dance 1200 steps on the northern line. To the left bank 300 times. E plus A. Line flag tiptoe. Okay, so I said she counted her steps to get through the tunnel. So obviously it's like a map somewhere. And that's correct. And then Stevie wonders who A is because she thinks... E is Eddie, and then A is Albert, maybe. It's none of that. It's pointless. Now you're going to get into it. Also, there's rough drafts of the truly devious letter, so it was more proof that it was related to the, or it wasn't related to the kidnapping. Then the power goes out. (laughs) Chapter 17. All the people at Minerva are now going to conveniently stay at the great house. So this is Pix, Janelle, Vi, Hunter, Stevie, Nate, and David. So Stevie and Nate are talking and Stevie basically says all this is pointless because the Ellinghams are dead. This is true though. This is exactly what my husband's been saying for like four books. So anyways, Nate suggests she tells someone what she found. She doesn't want her solving the case to be over. So she's not going to tell everybody. This is so dumb. So Charles and Dr. Quinn sit everyone down and they explain that everyone's going to sleep downstairs in the morning room. I don't know what that is, but that's where they're going to be. They're conserving power, so it's light and heated, but the upstairs and outside obviously are off limits. So I said, so I'm sure Stevie and David will go to one or both of those areas. Vi says that at least there's Wi-Fi, so we know this means that that email can be sent or whatever. The room's basically divided in two groups, those looking through the Edward King information, David, Vi, and Hunter, and those not Janelle, Nate, and Stevie. I know I sound like so bored, but literally none of this matters. Stevie goes to the bathroom and David, because she's having a panic attack, of course, and David's sitting outside waiting for her. He received a response email. Let's read. This is kind of important, but not. So it's to Jim from Dr. Quinn. CC on it is Charles. Mr. Mallory, that's Jim's last name. I don't see how that document is of any of the center's business regards Dr. J. Quinn. So... That part's not important, I guess, but the other one is. Stevie points out that there is a document. Duh, we know. We've seen the backflashes. Stevie asks David to respond as Jim. He says he will if Stevie leaves him alone completely, like they never talk and stuff. This is so weird. Like, their relationship. I read the reviews. People really like their relationship. This is the most toxic S I've ever seen in my entire life. Don't, we're never going to talk again. And then he, like, follows her around and, like, is in love with her. Don't ever be with someone like him and don't ever act like Stevie, period. So this part's kind of funny. David calls the Ellingham case her pet project and basically says he doesn't even think she wants to solve the Hayes, Ellie, and Fenton's death for the right reasons just because she wants to be like Nancy Drew and stuff. So they write a response. Let's read it. I know I'm reading a lot, but like, big who cares? The senator regards anything involving his son as his business. This is why the senator donated a private security system to assist you after your recent issues. I need not remind you that two students have died at the school and the senator's son ran off while under your supervision. The senator would like to know of any potential issues that may arise due to your negligence. This includes any publicities having to do with the historical issues of the school. We felt this was a polite way of getting information, but if you wish for us to take more illegal action, we will do so. Regards, Jay Mallory. Okay, whatever. Stevie compares this to Frankie and Eddie writing the Truly Devious letter, and I have no in all caps they actually like each other. David sends the note and then says, okay, you and me are done. Not like Frankie and Eddie. April 13th, 1937. It's been a year since the kidnapping. Albert invites... Flora, Leo, Robert, and Marsh to stay the night in Burlington with him. He's having the tunnel under the dome filled while they're gone. And Marsh offers to stay in case any press comes and things like that. I said, really, we know it's because he killed Dottie in the tunnel and doesn't want any evidence to be found. That's not why he stays. So, like, how can I come up with an idea that makes sense, but, like, the person writing it can't? Anyways, Leo notices that Marsh is lying about why he wants to stay just by like his mannerisms but he doesn't know why so after everyone leaves 
Marsh also left for several hours. He returned after all the workers went to bed. We go through his interaction with Dottie again, like from the beginning of the book, how he said, well, how he saw her and she was reading, blah, blah, blah. It's stupid filler. Marsh says he has been keeping Allie. Allie, that's my daughter. No. Marsh says he's been keeping Alice in an ice cellar. Like where and how, but okay. The workers had already filled the middle of the tunnel. So Marsh dug out part of it and returned Alice home by burying her there. Marsh goes into the house and to bed. Leo had been hiding, sorry, and wondering what Marsh had been up to. Leo goes back and traces Marsh's path to see where he had come from. That comes back. We explain more of that from Leo's perspective later. Chapter 18. Stevie wakes up and talks to Charles. He says that he believes she or someone with her passion could solve the Ellingham case, and that's why she was admitted. He had grabbed the house records, like the coming and the going, the guests, menus, etc., for her to look through if she gets bored. I feel like that never really comes back around. She asks to look at them in the ballroom because really she wants to look at Frankie's diary again. Frankie confirms that Iris and Flora were snorting cocaine. I don't really know why this matters, but who cares? She states that Eddie loves coke, but she's never tried it. Also, big who cares? Frankie is worried that Eddie couldn't actually run away with her and be an outlaw. She worries that he's just like all the other boys and people. Also, like, there's a lot of man hate in it. It's pretty ridiculous and not a fun read, but whatever. Then it's the Our Treasure poem again about the steps, etc. Stevie goes back to the group because they found something on Edward King. Have they, though? Have they found something? Something I care about? No. Okay, so Edward King, here's like the lowdown. He has a private investigator, and then there's a lot of money that starts coming in for the campaign, aka blackmail. It says they're still piecing it together, and I still don't care. So bad people do bad things like cover up oil spills, and Edward King finds out about it and blackmails them for campaign money. Vi wants to take them all down by sending it to the media. Janelle says, since the files were taken illegally, they should destroy them because then Edward King won't have leverage anymore. Vi throws the tablets in the fireplace and David says he'll flush the flash drives. This doesn't solve anything. You're telling me Edward King or his private investigator doesn't have any evidence of this just one set of flash drives? And he already knows what these people did, so he can keep blackmailing them. It's so stupid. They act like this works, though, later on. Pointless. Okay, Stevie feels like someone's watching her. Random and self-centered, but okay. Chapter 19. Janelle and Vi made up since Vi decided to take Janelle's advice and destroy the tablet. Stevie's on the stairs and notices the Ellingham painting. No secret tunnel or anything. Gosh. Okay, so anyways, it had been repainted with a different background compared to the picture that eddie took so now there's a moonbeam that points to the dome tunnel obviously because leo caught marsh burying alice out in the tunnel or whatever so then she again reads the instruction frankie wrote and falls oh okay this is dumb so she follows it on a map so please explain to me how this would work so stevie goes to like the front of the building and gets a school brochure and it has a map of the school And she looks and like the first line of the poem is all I care about starts at nine. Minerva is number nine on this map. Then like always the line flag line is there's a flag on top of the dome in the picture of this brochure. E plus A is Ellingham Academy, which is like a sign on the brochure. Okay, so you're telling me seriously, I'm going to try not to scream that they in the past hundred years, they have 80, excuse me. They have never changed the map. Minerva has always been number nine. This is a brand new school brochure, but it's the same as when Frankie wrote this. This would never happen. So anyways, Stevie wants to see what Frankie's referring to as treasure. It's dynamite, just so you know. So (laughs) I go, so the snowstorm doesn't matter now. And I said, calling it now, Stevie will meet a murderer in the, like where this map leads, like Dottie did in the dome. And she'll survive. The biggest of who cares is probably Charles, which I said in the last book. None of that happens, but okay. So Stevie sneaks out and follows the instructions, which leads to the statue that Frankie and Eddie would use to hook up and maybe write the Truly Devious letter, depending on which book you read. I roll. April 13th, 1937. I said, what the heck? Last chapter, it said that George was gone for several hours as soon as the group left. Now it says that Leo immediately said he was going to stay behind and was feeling ill before he even left the property. And Leo says that Marsh meandered the property all day. Inconsistencies. Was 
George gone for several hours or was he on the property all day? And we know that he was gone for several hours because he had to go get Alice. But this is BS. And like, write your stories correctly. Leo went into the hole and found Alice's body. Then he goes to Albert's office, retrieve the revolver to confront Marsh because he wants the whole story. Side note, he finds the keys to the desk hidden in the compartment in the clock. Big who cares? Leo never shows the gun to Marsh because he doesn't need it, but he confronts Marsh. Marsh does not admit his involvement in the kidnapping, but he does say that he found out who was responsible and like for Alice's death and they were taken care of and how he found Alice at that house, like buried in the yard. Marsh also admits that he knows he is Alice's bio dad. And I said, but is he really? That never comes back around. They agree to keep all this a secret because Albert would die without the hope of Alice being alive out there somewhere. I said, this is pointless, obviously, because they die anyways. Leo agrees, but still takes the gun to bed with him just in case. Also, this comes back to one of my lingering questions in one of the past episodes. Why didn't Marge on the boat just tell Albert all this? Pointless. Chapter 20. Stevie falls into the hole. Like, she opens the statue. She falls down. She looks around. Nothing new. It's just that grotto area, whatever. She then hears someone behind her in the cave. Oh, my gosh. It's David, obviously. He says he called for her, and when she didn't ask, answer, he went in for her. She says it would have echoed, but why would he lie? And it's making you suspicious, but for no reason. Like, the misdirection in these books aren't even good because it doesn't make any sense. Like, good misdirection should actually make sense, and then it should explain, well, later on, he didn't call for her because he felt weird about following her or something. That's not even good, but you know what I mean. So she tells him how Bath said that Ellie knew about the message. David's like, it wasn't me, and I don't know who did it. We find out. It's stupid. They go to climb out of the hole and discover the hatch is shut above them. Oh, no. I hope they die down there. Too bad they don't. Chapter 21. So David's freaking out. Reasonably so. Stevie kind of comes up with a plan to get them out. They're going to pile up bricks so she can stand on him, try to open the hatch. This is so drawn out. So as they're removing the bricks, they... Stevie's talking and David flips and is like, we don't always have to talk about the stupid case. Then she starts talking about Disneyland. Are you kidding me? He tells her to stop talking. Thank God. Waste of my time. So then when they're moving the bricks, there's like boxes uh, of dynamite around them, I guess. And David wants to use a stick to blow the door open. But before they set off the dynamite, Stevie tells David that she solved the case of the century. Did you guys know that? Because she talks about it nonstop. Stevie wants to know why she couldn't have a tablet. David admits that he didn't want his dad to get to her again. Then David says that his fake Jim got an email back and that's why he followed her, supposedly. So the email says it's from Charles and CC'd is Dr. Quinn. Mr. Mallory, we appreciate the senator's concerns and we certainly thank him for his help with our internal security system. Attached is a copy of Albert Ellingham's will. We trust that the senator will keep this strictly private. This is, I'm going to read it. In addition to all other bequeathed, the amount of $10 million, which now is supposed to be like, I don't know, like $2 billion or something. Anyways, shall be held in trust for my daughter, Alice Madeline Ellingham. Should my daughter no longer be among the living, any person or persons or organization that locates her earthly remains, provided it is established that they were in no way connected to her disappearance, shall receive this sum. If she is not located by her ninth birthday, 19th, excuse me, her 19th birthday, these funds shall be released to be used for the Ellingham Academy in any way the board sees fit period that's all it ever says in any of the other sections of the book but in this convenient copy it says it is further stipulated that no member of the faculty or administration of allingham academy may claim this sum as their own okay it literally never says the stipulation ever and i'm gonna get into that and i'm gonna be screaming but have you guys figured it out yet okay so stevie says the will's real whatever Someone on the board, I have in parentheses, Charles, can't claim it, so they are using Fenton or Hayes or whoever to get it instead because they found Alice's body when they cleaned out the tunnel, obviously. And I say, it super irritates me that you can't figure anything out until it's spelled out for you because the details are always changing and it's always revealed way too late, so you lose the aha moment. Anyways, David shows the email he got his dad. I was going to read it. It's pointless. His dad's like, I'm going to sue you and you're in big trouble, mister. And nothing ever comes of that. Anyways, so they blow up the door with dynamite, push the hap open somewhat, and they're still trapped in the hole because they're so far down. 
but this is better than nothing. And a hand pulls the door all the way open. It's Jermaine. Chapter 22. Jermaine helps pull them out of the hole and they walk back to the great house. Pix is surprised to see Jermaine. She tells them to get warm and she gives up, basically. Jermaine says that she noticed that none of them were on the like trolley thing or whatever. So she headed back to the school. She even let her parents know they didn't care. Stevie has a panic attack. Her medicine's back in the grotto. She's heading upstairs and barely functioning. I said, okay, because you know the riddle that doesn't make sense. That's why she's going upstairs. Always on a staircase, never on a stair, but I thought we figured that out. It has nothing to do with an actual staircase, but whatever. So Stevie figures everything out. That George must have buried Alice there. How she figured this out? We don't know. I guess she's a genius prodigy. When Fenton said the kid is here, she meant Alice is at the school. That's why she had Hayes looking in the tunnel, which we find out that doesn't even pan out. Now Stevie wants to gather everyone in the house. It's time to solve some murders. I said, I literally do not care. This is not even fun. Chapter 23, November 10th, 1938. Anarchists suspected an explosion death of Albert Ellingham. Recap of the boat blowing up. Who cares? It isn't true. Albert Ellingham buried on the mountain retreat in Boston Herald. You guessed it. Albert was buried at Ellingham Academy. These are just newspapers that Leo sees. And basically, Albert is like Jay Gabsy big who cares i'm not gonna spoil it in case we do that book like on patreon or something mackenzie shows leo the will that does not have the last line about no person on the board can claim it leo hides it in the green clock that's on the mantle and i said this book literally is an agatha christie nancy drew great gatsby ripoff and i'm not here for it okay just to prove my point i don't even have a page number but we're gonna find it okay so leo reads aloud the amount of 10 million dollars shall be held in trust for my daughter alice madeline ellingham should my daughter no longer be among the living any person persons or organization that locates her earthly remains provided it is established that they are in no way connected to her disappearance shall receive this sum if she is not located by her 19th birthday these funds shall be released to be used for the ellingham academy in any way the board see fits his mind was sound, Mackenzie says, but his heart was broken. That's what made him do this. That's all the will says. So somewhere between Leo putting it in the green clock and Charles finding it, this magical line appears. Inconsistencies, and that's the whole motive. Okay. Nothing else happens. They go over the dotty recording in Albert's office and Albert's last conversation with Mackenzie and the painting on the stair that Leo made waste of time. Chapter 23. Stevie calls everyone into the room and explains that all the deaths were connected and that Fenton died because she stood up for the case for Alice. She knew Alice was found in the trunk when the tunnel was being excavated for the art barn construction. The workers only found the trunk, but the person that opened it found the key to present day $70 million. Stevie turns to Charles. I said, I need to know when the will got the stipulation for a faculty member couldn't have it. The will Albert left does not say that, but the email response is the only place it does. Chapter 24. Stevie tells Charles that she saw the chest in the attic that was filled with old newspapers. So this is the chest or whatever that supposedly Alice was in. He says, yeah, that's correct. That's what they found. Stevie concludes that he needed someone not related to the school to find the body and collect so they could split it, aka Fenton, now on to Hayes. She assumes for no apparent reason that Hayes overheard something, so Charles was being more lenient about him traveling to California, which literally is never mentioned. But in this part, she says Hayes was bothering him about going back and forth from the school to California, and so Charles randomly started letting him, so he must have heard something he shouldn't have. The night Hayes died, he was supposedly meeting Charles. Like, who cares? Stevie also says Charles projected the message on Stevie's wall. So when the police came, she was found unstable, mumbling about a message on her wall. Okay, who cares? Then when Ellie got upset, when Stevie confronted her, she started saying Hayes and his stupid ideas, that's what got him killed. This, for no particular reason, freaked out Charles. That's why he locked her in the office and said to call a lawyer. And I have asterisks. Literally, this could be means and motive for anyone. Like, it doesn't even have to be Charles for it to make sense. It could literally be, like, picks, and it would still all completely make sense. So, apparently, Stevie believed it was part of the plan that Fenton would tell Stevie to look for the Minerva Tunnel because she had to find Ellie. Why? The school would have seemed unsafe and send her home, so then he could hide Alice 
if the school was shut down and then they could like go find her. Could he not just put Alice down with Ellie if he had to force someone to figure out the tunnel system? Like apparently he's the only one that knows about the tunnel system if he had to tell Fenton. So why not just put Alice down there and then have Stevie find her? I think I have that in my lingering questions too, but still. Then Stevie reveals the tin because it's all connected, question mark. It was all about money then and it's about money now. And I said, this isn't connected at all, but okay. So you're telling me that the whole thing with Dottie and Frankie and Eddie was because we had to make a connection to present day because Marsh wanted money then and Charles wants money now. That's why I read three books. Anyways, so then she says that Charles invited Hunter to the school because he still needs someone to collect the money. Hunter says he doesn't know about this plan, which like apparently there was enough time for that to happen. He was waiting for the school to shut down and then Hunter would have stayed and they would have split the money like him and Fenton. I don't know. So then Charles blew up the machine, aka like uh, Janelle's machine. I said, wouldn't it just be easier to change the last line in the will instead of murdering multiple people? Also, we don't even know if the will is really has that stipulation because it's not stated anywhere else. So anyways, so then she says Charles wanted Stevie to see the stipulation in the will so he wouldn't be a suspect. Charles sent the email after he figured out there was no gym. So he knew he was sending it to Stevie. But who cares? Stevie asked where the body of Alice is. Security Larry comes in and says he can answer that. And he has a wall scanner. And I said, what am I missing? There's no stipulation in the will. When did they change the will? Like literally like between Leo putting it in the clock and Charles finding it, nothing would have changed it. There's also no reason for Albert to write the stipulation. He had already figured out that Marsh was involved, who isn't on the board and isn't a teacher. So it's not like the person he hates most could collect on it. And couldn't Charles have just changed the part instead of murdering everybody? I don't know. Like, it's so stupid. So page 306, I guess. I don't know why I have us going to it, but let's see. Oh, that's what... (laughs) That's when I read, like, the part Leo. There's no... It doesn't exist. Anyways. Chapter 25. Larry comes in and they search Charles's office. Also, I'm like cutting to the chase, but Charles is like, you can't go in there without a lawyer. And then Dr. Quinn's like, I'm an equal person too. So you, you can't search his office. It's stupid. So Larry comes in, they search it. They find Alice in the wall. She isn't in anything. And I said, like how is she like mummified? She was in the ground for two weeks decomposing, then in a trunk for like 90 years, and then in a wall for a year. And you're telling me that Stevie saw a hand and a foot with a shoe on it? Like, no, she would not be in one piece and it would be all bone. And why not leave her in the trunk? (laughs) Chapter 26. (laughs) Stevie and David apparently stay the night in the ballroom and have sex because why not? Stevie talks to Larry the next morning and he talks to her like she's a real detective and the police are on their way. But all of this is probably enough to put Charles away. All of what? He could say, uh, Marsh probably put her body in the wall or one of the construction workers. I have no idea. Like, this is so stupid. So the police arrive and they hear shouting coming from Dr. Quinn and she's shouting for Charles. And then something drops down a chute. Larry calls the police to go into the basement. Chapter 27. There's a passage in the bathroom, apparently, that was sealed because it was dangerous. And Charles pried it open, jumped down it and died. A broken head, a nasty fall. It's all connected, you guys. Look how clever. (sighs) I said, I wish I would freaking fall so I forget reading these books. I would literally, no joke, read We Were Liars again before I'd read these series. Okay, so the people who work for Edward Keem come to take David home. David says bye to his girlfriend first. He says that he'll be in touch with her. Before he goes, he flashes her the inside of his pocket revealing a stick of dynamite. And I was like, 20 people are in this room, but no one noticed, including police. Like, this is so weird. Okay, so then there's just like a bunch of news articles like explaining what happens after this. So I just like summarize them. (laughs) Tragedy strikes again at Ellingham, Burlington Herald, November 11th. I said, no information. Charles dead, possibly connected to the deaths. (laughs) King faces donor backlash, politicalnow.com, November 27th. All his donors pull like their funding and say they were blackmailed. How would they know? that the files were destroyed and i'm pretty sure people being blackmailed aren't like i'm being blackmailed for all these things that would never happen like if i stole money and i was being blackmailed and then the person stopped blackmailing me because they didn't have proof of it i would just stop paying them i wouldn't be like hey news i stole money but this person's blackmailing me so just ignore that i stole money so stupid next article is the truly devious 
case solved true crime digest december 3rd still waiting for confirmation that it was really alice's body the truly devious letter was not connected and they're all like i can't believe it and i said i literally said this the first second it was said i was like why is this connected to the kidnapping you can go back and listen my first episode audio reveals edward king knew of the blackmail plans a bat report exclusive december 5th and let's read 349 oh 49 not 39 so this is like a quote he took the explicit flash drives the senator can be heard saying i had everything on those we had all those explicit just where we needed them that was everything we had to keep them in line now we have nothing nothing they're all going to back out we're explicit okay so i said that literally could mean anything though it's not even talking about blackmail specifically <sighs> Edward King withdraws president bid CNN January 2nd. He claims to withdraw for personal reasons. It's discovered that he has a son from a previous marriage that went to Ellingham. I said, no one knew this, but they live together. Oh my gosh. Okay. Ellingham Academy reopens the bat report January 11th. Case closed with no evidence. Page 352 is what my notes say. Police have completed their investigation into the former head of the school, Dr. Charles Scott, who was accused of causing the deaths of Hayes Major Element Walker and Dr. Irene Fenton. Police now have substantial evidence linking Dr. Scott to the crimes, including records of phone calls between Dr. Fenton and Dr. Scott's security footage from traffic and local cameras in Burlington on the night of Dr. Fenton's house fire and communications with banks in Switzerland inquiring how to open private and offshore accounts. That's not enough evidence, but okay... Burlington's the only town there. Would not be unusual for him to be there, but whatever. <laughs> Billboard explodes. Pittsburgh Press online February 16th. Basically, David blew up the quote-unquote racist billboard near Stevie's house. Big who cares. <laughs> DNA test on remains not a match for Alice Ellingham. True Crime Digest, April 7th. Me and my husband kind of discussed this a little bit. Okay, so this says, quote, The child was not related to either Albert Ellingham or his wife Iris, eliminating her from consideration as being the longest Alice Ellingham. Okay, I have a problem with this. Like, I have a problem with everything. I thought there was a file that her nannies or whatever that had her true identity. And, like, multiple people knew she was not the Ellinghams. And there was, like, these secret files. And that's how they were going to prove if someone came forward. And they said that the school got these files. But now that doesn't happen anymore. It's so stupid. Also, if they can't prove it, then Charles would have never got the money anyways. (laughs) Chapter 28. Stevie explains to Nate that she's sure George was responsible for Alice's death. That's wrong. He didn't kill her. Anyways, but that's why he buried her here. She says Flora was the only friend that went to the private birthing place. That's also wrong. Leo was there. Then she says that Marsh was there like at Ellingham the time that Flora would have gotten pregnant, which I'm pretty sure Alice was already born when Ellingham was built, but whatever. According to the food order, she can tell Flora had morning sickness. And I just have no, no, no. I've been pregnant. I'm not even going to get into it. It's just stupid. Hunter and Jermaine are apparently dating. Random. David's working for the campaign of his dad's rival, but also who cares because his dad's not even running. David's sister apparently recorded the reaction of David telling his dad he destroyed everything. And that's the bat report thing. But guess what, you guys? That doesn't make any sense because it says he took the flash drives aka he's talking to someone else not david you wouldn't be like he took the flash drives you'd be like david how could you take the flash drives okay are you guys ready stevie finally sees a moose (coughs) and then she walks away nate janelle and vi all say to themselves that wasn't a moose but we're just gonna let stevie have it and it's supposed to be I can't even explain it, but like the green lie at the end of the pier in Great Gatsby, but it's so poorly done. I can't even stand it. We're done with the book. Lingering questions. <laughs> Gosh, I can't stand this. Okay, so I have a buttload. <laughs> Why didn't the guy who was taking care of Alice collect the money after she died from measles? He could have claimed to have seen the newspapers after her death and realizing who she was, and he obviously didn't kill her. I said, I realized Marsh killed him, but he had two weeks before Marsh showed up. He even says he knows she's worth a lot of money, and they talk about how poor he was, so I don't know why he wouldn't do that. What was the point of the Edward King stuff? Like, some kids saved the day until the next political person came along. <laughs> like, who cares? Why did Charles bleh, Why did Charles specifically steal Janelle's stuff and target the Minerva house? Like, it doesn't really make sense. I mean, there's no motive behind any of this. And I said, why would Charles admit Stevie to the school in the first place? He didn't need her to solve the case. He didn't even need her to find the tunnel. He had already found the will. Why not just put Alice in the tunnel 
like later on and let Stevie find or Stevie or Ellie or whoever find her or Hayes even Fenton knew Alice was found if she's supposedly in on this plan from the get-go so why not say anything sooner and then like all of a sudden she wants to say something so he lights her house on fire literally does not make sense how many times have I said that also why did she have to have Stevie work for her if the plan was never for like her to find Alice I don't understand any of this why was Hayes going to the tunnel for the stuff if he was only blackmailing Charles? I don't get that either. Why did Charles keep the box that Alice was buried in and fill it with newspaper? And why did he show Stevie that? What was the point of all this? Okay. I want to know what happened to Flora and Leo, but that's just more out of, like curiosity on my part. What happened to Frankie and the baby she supposedly had with Eddie? Like that lady sent the email and was like, she ran off to Paris and had a baby, but she never emails back. She's like, I'll find information, email back. Why are these books so incomplete and terrible is my last question. Like, literally all this stuff is set into play and then it never comes back around. Like, Edward King was supposed to call Stevie. That never happens. That lady was supposed to email back. That never happens. Oh, we decided we want to make it Charles, so he has to have motive, so we're going to add something to the will that doesn't make any sense. And, like, I was reading in reviews. I'm not, like, a stickler for this, so I didn't really notice, but, like, people were saying that there was, like, grammatical errors and stuff. The whole thing seems rushed, poorly written, and I'm furious. So in a lighter note, in closing, we're starting a new book. So I got two books and one's by Karen M. McManus and one's recommended by her. As you know, she's been like one of my favorite authors in this genre. And she wrote One of Us is Lying, which I really enjoyed doing on the show. So we're going to dive into, for the next time, The Cousins. And I've seen this like all over Instagram and people are raving about it. So I'm really excited. So I'm going to read in typical dramatic fashion the inside cover. Millie, Aubrey, and Jonah Story are cousins, but they barely know each other, and they've never even met their grandmother. Rich and reclusive, she disinherited their parents before they were born. So when they each received a letter inviting them to work at her island resort for the summer, they're surprised and curious. Their parents are unwavering on one point. Not going is not an option. This could be their chance to get back into their grandmother's good graces. But when their cousins arrive on the island, it's immediately clear that she has a different plan for them. And the longer they stay, the more they realize how mysterious and dark their family past is. The entire story family has secrets. Whatever pulled them apart years ago isn't over. And this summer, the cousins will learn everything if they can survive the season. So I'm super pumped, you guys. So, as always, thanks for listening. You can find me on Instagram and Facebook at the Jolly Reader Podcast. Let me know what you thought of the series. Let me know any books you want me to read. Let me know if you've read The Cousins, if it's good. No spoilers, though. If you're on Apple Podcasts, please leave a review to help other crewmates find the podcast. Share with everyone, per usual. Stay tuned for your weekly dose of secondhand embarrassment via the outtakes. And I will talk to you next time for part one of The Cousins. Until we sail again, this has been The Jolly Reader. Bon voyage. Hey, you made it to the outtakes. Let's do it. Testing. I'm going to try to keep the animal noises to a minimum, but I cannot promise because they're already barking at a dog across the street. Can't wait to finish this series. I hope this mic is working Good day. Dogs, can you go lay down, please? Go lay down. It's literally... Hey! It's, um... It's... Why can't I think of her name? I don't know why I have Andy, but anyways... You guys, my dogs are the worst. Um, hold on. Text message. My daughter's next door, so I want to make sure she's okay. Oh, she sent a video. Pause. It's a video of my daughter singing a bunny song is so cute. Anyways. Leo hides it in the great clock in the mountain. In the mountain. Tragedy strikes again at Ellingham slash Burlington. Oh, no. Shh. I am Allie. And you are with me to my mom.